Hi, folks. Thanks so much for joining us today. I just wanted to give you a quick overview of Gina Maffa's background. She's a licensed clinical worker in a private practice in New York City, and she's done this for nearly 20 years, worked in this field, and has helped thousands of people seeking treatment for grief and trauma. This includes her work at the Holocaust Survivors at 92Y, an international nonprofit, as well as a clinical director for Mount Sinai Outpatient Program, specializing in addictions. Of course, I'll have her full bio available to you. I recommend that you check out her website as well as her new book. Her new book is called Moving On Doesn't Mean Letting Go. And of course, I'll have all the links to where you can head over to her website as well as checking out her new book. Please enjoy this conversation. It's very insightful for those of us suffering from grief and trauma. Thanks so much again for watching and enjoy. Thank you so much for being with us today. We have Gina Maffa with us. And of course, prior to this conversation, I recorded a snippet to tell you all about her. Her credentials are far reaching. Her experience is far reaching. Gina, thank you so much for being with us. If you could give us a little bit of your background and why we're here today, obviously to talk about grief, that would be a great place to start. Absolutely. And thank you again, Carol Ann, for having me. And hello to everybody. Um, I really, you know, I am, um, I'm a therapist in New York City. I have a private practice where I specialize in trauma and loss. Um, most, uh, most recently, it's been more loss since the pandemic. Um, but yeah, I, I've been doing this work uh, since 2004. And, you know, by way of trauma, I call grief trauma sister. And so I sort of fell into it, but, you know, it's something that is so prevalent. It's something all of us have experienced or will experience in our lives. And to me, it feels really important to be able to talk to people, to bring out a lot of the stigmas or the myths around grief and loss and, and even trauma to light so that we can start to talk about it, break the stigma, and also just help people to cope better and to, to hide a little bit less. So I'm really happy to be here. Thank you so much. Um, let's talk first about your book. Uh, I read your book, obviously, and it, it made such an impact on, on me personally as someone who unfortunately suffered the loss of her husband of 47 years, three, two years ago. So um, I'm still struggling with grief in so many ways. And your book just nailed it. It just nailed every nuance of grief and what you feel and kind of like to forecast what to expect too, because it's ever changing every day. So let, let's talk a little bit about your book. The title is moving on. Does it mean letting go? That is brilliant. And um, it's also something just the title is something that I'm struggling with right now. So let's talk about what what drove you to write this book. What was your driving force? I know you also had a loss in your life. So let's talk about that. Sure. You know, I had lost my mom in 2016 to cancer. Um, it was pretty quick. But, you know, and, and at the time I was a grief therapist. And, you know, I don't know that I really understood. It wasn't the only loss I'd had in my life, but it, I don't know that I understood specific things about grief um, that I experienced with the loss of my mother until I lost my mother. And, and I'll get into that for sure. But, um, you know, along those lines, sort of, it really set me up to be able to participate more fully as a grief therapist during the pandemic. And this is really when I had the idea to write a book, mostly because my clients were asking for more, you know, more ideas between sessions. There was so much loss and, and different types of loss, not just uh, death losses, but job loss and home loss and, you know, loss and breakups and loss of uh, safety and loss of affection. You know, mm -hmm. we couldn't touch each other or hug. And uh, it brought loss to the forefront. And my clients were asking for books to recommend. And I kept recommending books and they just weren't hitting the mark. And 
one of my clients said, you know, we love what you're saying. I love, you know, she came with a, her husband. We, we love what you're saying. And why don't you write it? Because this is, this is someone we can really resonate with. And I hadn't thought because thankfully imposter syndrome really uh, kicked in. I didn't really ever think I could do it, even though I'm in the trenches with people for 20 years. And so I finally just decided why not give it a try. You know, a lot of people didn't have access or continue not to have access to therapy for multiple reasons, mm -hmm. whether financial or location or not knowing how to start. Some people had a bad experience with a therapist. Some people don't know what to expect and maybe aren't ready. Um, and therapy is not for everybody, right? So I wanted to write a book that was for all of those people, um, but also that could really help prepare us and walk us through what happens when we have the grief fall, which is that moment or we get the call, or we get the diagnosis, and nothing is ever the same. And so um, I talk a lot about that in my book, when I had my first grief fall losing my mom, and the phone call that I got from my father shortly after. Um, and so yeah, it felt really important for me to modernize talking about loss and, and helping people to understand their experience in a way that can be a little bit more empowering and not so confusing and overwhelming and unpredictable as it is. Gosh, that's so very true. Uh, and COVID truly changed our lives in so many ways. And and I, I mean, I guess there's lessons in that to be learned, but it, it was mostly disastrous for everyone. Um, yeah. So let, let's talk about um, how does a person in the midst of grief begin to process these emotions, confusion, fear, anger, panic? Because for me, they happened all at once. It was, it, I've never in my entire, and I've lost my parents and loved them dearly, but they were elderly. And you, I think you kind of expect people, we're not going to last forever, right? So you kind of expect people when they're in the 80s to, to pass. Not that you expect it, but it's not like a shocker. Let's put it that way. And right. you have time to, you know, accept that, that that's just the way God created our universe in the way that it is. But when you, when you get thrusted upon, like with COVID or the death of a spouse, suddenly um, it, it's impossible, I find, to deal with the just everything all at once. Anger, depression, mm -hmm. fear, panic. What do you recommend for folks? Like what baby steps to start maybe? One of the things I think leads to all of that panic is we don't really know what's happening to us, right? We don't know that our brains and our nervous systems are, are in complete survival mode. We don't know that they're shutting down. And when that happens, we can't reason. We have a really hard time functioning because our brains are saying, wait a minute, what has always been here is no longer here. And so what was predictable, I now have to figure out how to redefine in a different way, because we still have to stay connected to this person, but they're not in the way, they're not in the place, in the space that they used to be. Right. And so when we're processing that information, it's as if everything else shuts down and we're in pure survival mode. And so one of the things that I talk about in my book is really how in the very beginning of a loss, we are, we are experiencing a trauma simply because our nervous system doesn't know what to do right now. It's in a place it has not been before and it's experiencing a sense of danger. And I say that to you because it, it makes all of the emotions feel incredibly blurry and confusing. Mm -hmm. And we try so hard to say, but, I knew he was sick or this could have happened or, you know, all of these things. And, and it is the hardest thing to do. We can't remember things. We have brain fog, our physical body. And this is one of the things I learned after the loss of my mother is our physical body becomes involved a lot. You know, a, a lot of our ways of coping are really physical after a loss. We're hungrier, we're less hungry, we're tired, we're less tired, we're at panic all the time, our heart raises, races, we feel anxiety. And this is stuff we don't always know to expect because we've always historically been taught by society that grief is an emotional experience. Mm -hmm. And so take all of that into account of what I just said 
And it's really overwhelming, right? Yeah. Even just hearing all of that, it's like, whoa, all of that is happening in the beginning stages of a loss. And so what I tell people is understanding that this is a full body experience. First and foremost, we have to make sure that we are taking care of our body. We have to be drinking enough water. We have to be eating enough protein because protein alone will help us to cope with, you know, it, it feeds our nervous system. We have to be able to rest. We have to be able to move. After that, and we get out of survival mode, then we can process emotions. But in the very beginning of grief, we're in a survival state. Our entire immune system is up in arms. Every, every system within our body is saying, danger, something really big is happening. There's a huge life stressor happening right now. And we don't know if we should shut down or we should, we should start to panic and save our lives. And so understanding that even though it sounds complicated and scientific and all of that, and I'm, I'm, I'm obviously simplifying it, it is still something that we don't understand within grief. And if we can understand that first, we wouldn't put so much pressure on ourselves to feel the sadness or to feel all of the things that we then feel because our brains are racing. Does that, does that make any sense or am I? Oh gosh, it makes a hundred percent sense. Um, one of the things I find very frustrating about our medical system in the United States is the lack of mental health attention, treatment, that sort of thing. I mean, even if you look at states like California where there's homelessness and drug addiction, I mean, this should be a top priority. But that brings me to this. Um, when your health care provider knows, and they know everything, let's face it, that you you had a loss, whether it be a parent, a, you know, whatever, your husband, a sister, brother, whatever. I, I, I'm shocked that they don't reach out and initiate some type of dialogue because I'll get emails on the dumbest things like phone calls. Uh, did you take your Cola Guard test? Did you such silly things? Not that, that they're silly, but um send me an email like don't why do you have to call me it's just it's <laughs> frustrating because i get so many calls regarding things they they should be calling people and asking how their mental health is why do you think that grief in and of itself is not a bigger player in the health field situation i think yeah it's really disappointing i think things are beginning to change as more and more people try to teach about grief literacy but you know the medical field itself has always also been taught that grief itself grief and loss is an emotional state and the idea that there's a you know mind body connection is not a new thought so the medical field at this point understands the mind body connection but they really don't know to the extent of what things within <laughs> within the mind, for example, will affect the body, right? So they don't necessarily understand trauma. They don't understand loss. They understand right. depression and anxiety. Those are the two things. That's so true. you'll always see people, you know, getting antidepressants from their GP. That's as far as they go. But things like trauma and things like grief for them feel like things that they need a mental health provider for and therefore mm -hmm. has nothing to do with them. Now, if they really could understand that grief is a full body experience, they would have a lot more uh, input with how it actually does affect blood pressure, right? I mean, we've heard of broken hearted syndrome. That is a real thing. Our blood pressure has changed. Our hearts are actually physically um, brought into this. There's our immune systems, right? Um, I talk about in my book, when my mom died, I I was so sick. I didn't know at the time that this was going to be a physical manifestation of my grief, mm -hmm. but I was so busy. I had to, had a lot of things happening all at once, a lot of different losses within the same week. But when my mom died, I got really sick and I had a lot of losses all at one time. And I remember going to the doctor and the doctor saying, but when did your mom die? And I said, you know, a couple months ago or whatever. He's like, no, it's not that you should be fine. Um, and really it was grief. I didn't mm -hmm. have time to grieve. There was a lot happening with me. My blood pressure was elevated. There was a lot happening. I wound up having a thyroid disorder, pancreatitis. I wound up in the hospital and it was a really difficult time. And I wouldn't attribute all of that to grief, of course, 
But because I was not taking care of my body and I wasn't right. tending to sort of my own basic needs, I wound up getting sicker and sicker and sicker. And so that's sort of why in the beginning of this conversation, I made sure to say your body has to come first because grief takes endurance. And if you don't take care of your body, your doctor is not going to be checking up on you to make sure right. m more of the time than not. Now, obviously, I live in New York City where doctors see, you know, hundreds of people a day sometimes. And so you really do have to be your own advocate. Um, you know, I do think that that will be changing for sure, you know, because of the pandemic. If I say that anything positive came from something like this, it's that grief in and of itself is more widely understood and accepted. And even though right. it's less science and more mystery, there's a lot more attention being placed on it. And once we get to that place and, you know, the medical field can understand, I think they'll be able to step in better. But obviously there needs to be more training and more grief literacy out there for the healthcare field. You know, many fields actually could use grief literacy because grief affects everything. If you're yes. going back to work, people don't know what you're going through, right? It's, it's a life changing event and it is not, you know, done within the allotted three days of bereavement leave. This is with you for life. Yes. And that is so misunderstood. And, you know, if there's anything that I hope my book does or I can do as uh, an advocate and in this field is to bring that to a, a bigger audience. Brilliant. That was so well said. Um, gosh, I have so many questions spinning around in my head. Um, let's talk about for a second how when my husband passed away, a lot of it is a is a fog, like you, you talked about brain fog. Um, like when I had to depart with his items and his clothing, I blocked that out so deeply that I have very little memory of it. Um, it, it was that painful. So how, you know, and it, it always remains painful. It, it's not yeah. just like this week period where, you know, you have to do something like that or make funeral arrangements or, but so in the beginning of grief, when grief first hits us, like you were saying about your mom, what advice do you have for people that are in this panic mode and, or in this brain fog mode and that they're not getting like the support that they they really need from people not because it's intentional but i think a lot of people just don't know how to give that support well i think people don't know how to give it and i think people don't know what they need and so you know one of the things i think that is tricky about grief is that our needs change a lot from moment to moment you know i want to be alone no i don't i i'm too alone now i want to be around people and then when i get around people i don't want to be around people you know, and I'm hungry and then I eat and I'm nauseous. And so it can be a really crazy making experience. And so, you know, brain fog and, and look, I'm going to sound like a broken record. I think like things like my book, I always say, read something like my book before you go through loss, because then you really understand what to expect. And it will take you a little bit less by surprise. If I understood I was going to not remember most of my mother's last week in the world, um, I would have at least, I would have not panicked and thinking I was going through, you know, a cognitive disorder or, you know, having some kind of stroke or something because like, I was like, wow, I, I'm a young person. My mother died in my thirties. Like I should, I shouldn't, I'm shocked that I can't remember these things, what's going on with me. And I was really, really scared. And this is somebody coming from a grief background, but they didn't teach about all of this. And so mm -hmm. I think that I would have, number one, I would have panicked less. I would have had an understanding of what to do. I would have expected less for myself. I would have reached out for different types of help. I would have accepted different types of help. I think people ask what we need and it sounds great, but how many of us really ask for what we need, right? If somebody says to you like, Carol Ann, like, I'm here, just tell me what you need. How right. many times do you actually follow up and tell them what you need? Yeah. Yeah. That's so true. You don't, you don't, because number one, you don't know what you need. And number two, reaching out is so exhausting and it's really, really hard. So, I mean, I think that's why I continue to say, just take it to basics, be gentle with yourself, 
make sure that you are just taking care of your body. And when people say to you, hey, what do you need? You can always reply, what do you got? I like that. (laughs) You know, because, because I always say to people who ask me, Gina, how do I help somebody that I love who's grieving? And I'm saying, don't ask them what they need, just do. If you know them well enough, do something. If you don't know them well enough, send them a card, right? But because no one's ever going to volunteer you to do something once in a while. But most of the grievers I know, including myself, are not really taking people up on when they say, hey, tell me when you need something. Because time moves so fast. And it actually takes a lot more energy to figure out what I need and how to ask you to get it for me. Right. And it would be to just true. sit in my brain fog. And and so, you know, when I say go gently, tend to your body, take it one day at a time, don't try to get ahead of yourself. It sounds really silly, but it is the best thing you can do for yourself because right then and there, unless, you know, you know what you need at all times and you have a great community to give it to yourself, give it to you, you are going to be in a state of shutdown for a while. So true. So true. In your book, you talk about the different types of, of loss and, and, I found that part a little bit confusing and I wanted to know more about it. And then of course you went on to explain, you talked about ambiguous loss, disenfranchised grief, anticipatory grief and secondary loss. Like you mentioned Mm -hmm. some of that. Let's just cover some of that for folks because like you said, you know, it's funny because for an example, when my sister got divorced, she said to me that that felt like, grieving a death too. Mm -hmm. So where are they similar? And like, just talk to us about that. Sure. Well, a divorce can be an ambiguous loss because there's a body still there, but the relationship is gone. An ambiguous loss can be somebody that we love who is diagnosed with a progressive mental health disorder or has an addiction that takes them farther away from us. It's a, a loss where there's no closure. There's, you know, and so it is a really painful loss. So Mm -hmm. the reason that I talk about different losses is because number one, if you're reading a a grief book, I want it to be as comprehensive as possible. So you may think you're picking up the book because of the loss of your husband, but then in learning about other types of losses, you know, you think, Oh my gosh, I, I knew he was sick and I did experience anticipatory grief ahead of time or Wow, I I also was divorced at one point, say, and I did experience this type of ambiguous loss. And this way, in a way, we get to clean out the whole system. So we get to grieve all of the things, right? Because I don't want, I mean, and obviously at your own pace and not all at one time, exactly. But I think understanding all of the different times we've grieved in our lives in all of the different types of ways can help us, number one, be more grief literate. And also understand and be more gentle and respectful of all the different times that we've experienced grief without even knowing it. You know, so, I think so, it's so true what you're saying. And it, like, it, it seems to me like grief, wherever it comes from, is responsible for the depression, for the anxiety. So rather than just treat the depression, it makes so much more sense to treat the grief like. Yes. Yeah. But people people often, I mean, you'd be surprised how many people were coming to me for one thing. And I'm like, wow, you're really grieving a lot of different things. And they would say, but what do you mean? Oh, but that wasn't a death or, oh yeah, but you know, uh, that doesn't seem worthy. You know, I I talk about disenfranchised grief, which is a loss where, you know, a, a community gets to decide what's worthy of grieving and who it, you know, who is not. And that could be somebody who's, you know, if we're talking about somebody who's, gay and they die of what you know back in the day maybe aids and people would be very quiet about it very hush you couldn't talk about it and that type of loss is still loss that is still incredibly deep grief but communities decide that it's too shameful to be grieved and this happens now this is an extreme example but this happens in families all the time depending on what the loss is people who die of an overdose they feel a lot of shame and therefore they don't feel like they have the capacity to grieve because it is a shameful type of grief and it's not fair and it doesn't actually take the grief away. 
And so I really just wanted people to have permission to grieve all the things that they didn't understand were grief or to grieve in the ways that feel at least more honest. Why do other countries seem to have a better way of dealing with grief than you? I mean, I just noticed that. <laughs> like, what's up with that, Gina? Oh, my God. Well, you know, uh, you know, the, the Western world is really interesting. I blame mm -hmm. capitalism and industrialization. If we go way, way back, right? We started to be a culture of do create, do it faster, do it efficiently. And that means everything from, you know, car production to mental health care. Mm -hmm. And so for me, it's this is the nation of winning. You mm -hmm. know, we're the nation of winners and we pick ourselves up by our bootstraps. These are mantras that, you know, my grandfather said all the time, you got to pick yourself up by your bootstraps. Great. Right. Okay. What if I can't, right. you know? And, and so that wasn't a thing. And so we don't do grief well because we don't do anything that is not stoicism or being hard and tough and winners. And, you know, I'm strong and Viking like we don't do that well. And we're not sensitive to our own pain. We're trying to plow through it, be strong. There's so much dignity, quote unquote, and being strong and not in vulnerability where it should be. And so we then alienate ourselves. And once we're alienated, because we're then ashamed that we have bad feelings or sad feelings, mm -hmm. then nobody is ever going to get help. And then the more we perpetuate that, the more society is just this society of winners and keepers and Gosh, picking yourself so up by your bootstraps. And we're not afraid of it. If we could be a, a, a country or a society that was not afraid of hard feelings and sad feelings, which I hope we're headed in that direction. But if we could, they wouldn't be so bad. We could just show up for one another and the feelings would come through us and it would be bad sometimes. And we'd let them in and we'd feel them. And then they would be gone because we weren't fighting against them. And sure, they would come back because that's grief, but it wouldn't be something that we hide or, or you know, repress in some ways. And I think that's really a part of it is that we sit in shame of what we feel because it's not acceptable, especially grief because it lasts forever and it comes up on anniversaries or meaningful days or birthdays, all of that. And people don't understand it. So it, it makes it really hard. It truly does. And that's why I really appreciate the title of your book. Moving on doesn't mean letting go because I'm struggling with that right now, two years later. Um, you know, everybody egged me on in the beginning to move on. I heard a lot of he's dead now. There's nothing you could do to bring him back. You have to move on. So I, I, I this was like pounded into me almost daily and I said, OK, well, I have to move on. So you start moving on and then you start having all this guilt about moving on. Yeah. Talk to us about that. <laughs> well, yeah, my book title is definitely um, sarcasm. <laughs> it is the New Yorker in me right there. Right. Because I also, you know, I work with so many people that are like, I know I have to move on. I know I have to move on. Mm -hmm. As if you have to move on and leave something behind because it's right. the only way to move on. And yeah, so to me, it was like, no, I'm sorry, people moving on doesn't mean letting go. We take our people with us and they show up in all of these ways. And you just have to deal with it because that's how relationships work. People die, relationships don't. And so you still, you get to decide how your husband shows up in your life these days and how you honor him and how you move forward with him, not on. And, you know, and it is really just speaks to people's discomfort of loss. And, so and it really true. bothers, it really bothers me because it's like, people don't understand it. They want everyone to hurry up and move on until it's them. And it will be, it will be all of us. And when it's them, they'll say to you, Caroline, now I know what you were going through. Now I get it. You can't get it until you get it. But it isn't, isn't it sad that it takes that for us to be sensitive and patient with one another? So, yeah, so that, that is really sad. it. Yeah, it's tragically sad. Um, I, I noticed, though, that a lot of people just are very uncomfortable talking about death just in general. So I always forgive folks when I encounter that 
because I, I understand that it's it's painful and uncomfortable. And nobody wants to deal with it. Um, but but it's so important to deal with it. Um, you know, we all die. Everybody. I mean, how about losing a pet? That is such a tragic. I can't. My, when my dad passed away, I lost my dog on the same day. Oh, same day. So it was, you know, and I had that dog for 12 years, loved him like a son. So of course. You know, how do you deal with a culmination of tragedies? Because I, especially since COVID, I've seen people lose their jobs, lose a spouse, lose family relationships over <laughs> disagreements. Just in general, I'm not going to get into it, but you know what I'm talking about. So sure do. how do people when faced with catastrophic losses all at once, what, I know it's, it's so hard to answer that question, but what would you recommend that, that somebody does first see a doctor, take medication? I mean, what direction do you think I they don't. should go in? And no, I, I never, I'm not a, a proponent of medication unless it's a last resort and they're mm -hmm. feeling, um, not a last resort, but unless it's really physiological, you know, like anxiety, and they just can't seem to curb it with any kind of mindful activities, or even just therapy, if it's something that's pervasive, then we'll say, okay, maybe you do need something. Or if the grief keeps getting worse and worse and worse in terms of daily functioning, or wanting to isolate or not being able to go back to work, that's those are the times I would say, let's, let's talk about potentially medication helping you just in this temporary time. Um, you know, but this goes back to what I spoke of earlier, which is grief is a trauma. Mm -hmm. and now you're talking about multiple losses. Um, and if a pet is involved, like at least it's the one loss that people actually give us permission to grieve in That's some so ways. <laughs> people will say, oh my God, how terrible, the worst death ever, right? <laughs> you know, we have so much empathy for a dog yes. more than people. And in, in some ways, it's really interesting. Humans are very interesting. Mm -hmm. um, but, you know, in any event, these are traumatic events going on. And, and like I said earlier, when you're in survival mode, it's really, I'm not really going to say, well, let's talk about how you feel. How, tell me about your sadness today. Because 100% of the time, those people are shut down. They're numb. They're in a state of shock. And their whole, whole nervous system is scanning for danger around them. It's in yes. fight fight flight or freeze basically and and that is important for people to know because we push people to say tell me how you feel and really it's like actually tell me if you're sleeping tell me if you're able to eat because again when it's something like that i'm going to actually always come back to your physical self-care right. once we get through that then i'm going to talk about all of the things that you're doing mostly probably ruminating on things you could have done differently, things you wish you did, things you wish you did 20 years ago. And that is sort of how it goes, you know, in that order. And then we can actually talk about letting go and, you know, and not letting go of the person or the relationship, but letting go maybe of the guilt we sometimes feel after loss or, you know, the, the holding on to all of the things that we wish were different. Um, because that's truth in loss too, is that we don't just have a beautiful, clean, loss. Mm -hmm. We don't think, oh, what a beautiful death they had and how wonderful that they're at peace. May they always rest in peace. And I'm going to float along on, you know, on my magical river and proceed with my life. It's rarely the thing that happens. Right. And so there's a lot of different messy stages of grief that we don't talk about, which I really did want to talk about in my book, which is that we do ruminate. We do wish things were different or we look at the things we could have done again and again, and we forget that we're in a, a state of survival, which grief thrusts us into time and again. And so if it's catastrophic, you better be believing it, that your body and taking care of your body is the first most important thing you have to do, or you will not get through it with ease. And, and you're not going to get through it with ease anyway, right. but you're not going to get through it without some sort of physiological distress in some way. That's that's gospel because um, I forgot to eat. I mean, there would be days that I would get up and just not think about food until somebody said to me, did you eat today? And I'd be like, no, I guess I 
should go eat something. And then it would be a bowl of cereal because who wants to cook? Who wants? Yeah. That's why you said it's so important for people to say, what do you need? Um, you know, and, and think of bringing them food or doing something small like that it is huge. Um, yeah. Yeah. I mean, what you said is just all gospel uh, taking care of yourself because I got physically ill as well. Like you, I had a plethora of physiological problems. I had a pain, a mystery pain in my side that just came out of nowhere. Went to a stomach doctor, couldn't find anything. And then, you know, when I came to terms with that, that my pancreas was okay, it went away. Like it just magically disappeared. It's it's so psychological, a lot of our suffering. We do make, make it physical. We manifest it physically. Uh, about the medication thing, um, I think that's an important topic because when I went to see my medical doctor about a week after my husband passed, the first thing he did before even talking to me was prescribe antidepressants and anti-anxiety. And I'm not into that, never was. I, I mean, like you said, if you, if you have to take it, God bless you, take it. But for me personally, my journey was to not take th those medications. Yeah. I mean, look, to be honest, when you're grieving, um, like I said earlier, unless it's affecting your functioning um, pervasively over time, right. but I don't think it's where you start, right? This is a prime example of doctors not wanting you to feel what you feel. They want to numb you out and they want to fix a problem. You exactly. can't fix a broken heart. Right. You can't fix what is mostly a, a spiritual injury. And oh, so what you are going to then do is shut somebody off from their experience, which will inevitably come over time then much worse later. And so for me, I mean, there's a lot of really great supplements out there that can help people with anxiety, like L-theanine. There's 5-HTP, which can help people when they're depressed. You can get that stuff in CVS and it doesn't have side effects. And one of the things that's really hard for me to hear is because these chemical meds have a lot of side effects that come yes, with they them. Do. And, you know, and you don't really know what you're putting in your body, how it will react with other medications you're taking. And then if you want to come off of it, it's a whole other ordeal. Exactly. And so, you know, and if you forget to take it for a period of time, now you've added another burden to your already grief stricken life. And so I do not shame medication or those who take it and who need it 100%. But I don't think it needs to be the first line of combat when we are experiencing a loss, unless it is something somebody wants or right. really, really needs. But it's few and far between in my work. That's great to hear. Uh, it's not for everybody, medication. And I knew that it, it wasn't for me. And, and, you know, I could go visit him tomorrow and he'd still tell me, are you taking the antidepressants? <laughs> because... <laughs> <laughs> it's just i mean maybe he needs to listen to this episode yeah, it's, it's, it's a great okay guy. doctor he really but is a great it's not guy. his fault right it's exactly. not his fault it's just that it is the medical field and they are in the solution finding business and this is what they know um and it is my hope that that will change as physicians go through medical school i i i I hope so too. Let's talk about grief counseling for a second. Sure. Because, um, I knew a friend of mine lost um, his wife uh, and he was resistant to going to grief counseling, um, suffering terribly, but very resistant to going. Me, on the other hand, I jumped at the opportunity. And now, nowadays we have virtual therapy. We, you know, you don't have to get up and get dressed and go to an office. You Do you do virtual therapy as well, Gina? I meant to I do, that. yes. That's wonderful. So of course, we'll have your website and all that information running across the screen for folks and also in the description of this video and in an article on Sassy Town. Oh my goodness, I'm <laughs> everywhere. <laughs> you're you're going to be everywhere. Um, oh. But what do you think about, what advice do you give uh, to somebody who's resistant to say grief counseling? Oof. Well, you know what? I am a therapist and I do champion therapy. I do believe though that for some people, therapy is not where they connect. And so my challenge would be to him, uh, what does work for you? Where mm. do you find your comfort, right? For me, the wisdom is not in the therapy. The wisdom is in whatever works. 
So maybe it is a bunch of books you read and podcasts you listen to that get you over the hump until you maybe want to join a support group at some point if you're feeling isolated. I think the main goal for me is, are you isolating yourself after a loss? And do you feel like you have enough support? Because one of the things that's most important after a major loss is connection. Because yeah. loss in and of itself is a huge, significant disconnection. And the, and the healing is, and the healing balm in all of this is authentic, deep connection. And so it doesn't matter to me where you get that. Because some people are in therapy and their therapist is clueless has no idea about grief, perhaps it's not their specialty. And look, therapists are human, there aren't many of us who specialize in grief. So many of them are also afraid of it. You know, in graduate school, there were no classes specifically dedicated to grief in my graduate program, I had to go off and do training on it. And, you know, even then, sometimes it doesn't feel like enough. But you know, that said, If you are going to seek therapy, I would seek somebody who has either a specialization in grief, has a certification in grief, or has taken grief classes, and and do not be afraid to ask them. Um, But, you know, the thing about therapy is it's tricky because you could have somebody then who who specializes in grief, and maybe you don't hit it off. And so I'm going to say at the end of the day is the wisdom is in whatever works and whomever works. If you have a great therapist and you feel a deep connection, stick with them. If you do not have a therapist yet, make sure that you feel safe enough and comfortable enough to talk to them about everything. Because if you're forced into therapy, um, you know, I can't say to this man that therapy is the be all end all for him. It is really where he could feel connected and feel like he's getting some semblance of comfort. Sometimes it's with a support group, right? Some people don't want a one on one experience, they want people around them who understand what they've gone through. And that is how they heal. Great. I champion that. For some people, they don't want to talk to other people about what they feel and they want that one-on-one experience. And some people are not either fans of therapy or they've had a traumatic experience with a therapist or they can't afford therapy. And maybe they need alternative healing tools, you know, like something virtual that they watch on YouTube or, you know, there's a lot of, there's a lot of tools out there that you can Mm -hmm. get my main concern is isolation. So no matter who's listening to this, if you're isolating, I'm talking to you, you've got to connect somewhere. Mm. Yeah, that's, that's so true. That was my country road in answering your question. No, that was brilliant. <laughs> uh, you know, and, and about the group therapy thing too. It's so true. I tried doing grief share and uh, I went to one local meeting and I, all I did was cry through the whole thing because listening to other people's stories broke my heart and I was yeah. in the midst of my own grief. And so for me, I couldn't handle like everything, but it's funny because when time passes and then you go back, everything changes like, because it really is very stage related, your grief, right? So like where you are in the beginning is very different from where you are a year later. Well, you know, yes and no, I wouldn't call it stage related as in the five stages of grief, but I would call it stage related as in it's cyclical at times. Very. And so if you feel like you're back at stage one, you know, holidays bring that out, you know, yes. holidays, birthdays, anniversaries, or other meaningful days can really make us feel like we're at square one again. And I just want to emphasize that if that is you, that you're not at square one again, but this is grief and it's a sneaky jerk sometimes. And sometimes you can smell something and it's somebody's cologne out of nowhere and you're brought right back to square one again. And I think it's just important to know that you are going to cycle through a lot of different emotions and physical experiences and that all of them are okay. And that it doesn't mean you're failing at anything. And it doesn't mean that you're not progressing, quote unquote, like people want you to, you know, but that it's okay. I think the five stages of grief kind of are a little deceptive because I think like I always thought, you know, you're in stage one and then two and then, but you're right. It's so cyclical. And and while they're, I think they're all true. They just bounce all over the place. Yeah. Well, Elizabeth Kubler-Ross created those five stages of grief for somebody who was terminally ill. 
And for them, it makes sense because there's a very, there's a first stage and an end stage because they won't make it past that end stage. Right. She didn't intend for those stages to be adopted by grievers. Oh. It was adopted by grievers because nobody had a jumping off place. And so I, I love that we have some semblance of a structure, mm-hmm. but it really is misleading because number one, there's more than five stages and anybody who's been through grief will know that. And that it doesn't, it, it doesn't actually include the entirety of the spectrum of grief, right? Sometimes we're in acceptance, but maybe not. Maybe we're rageful, but maybe only a little bit. Maybe we're somewhere between sad and angry one day. And so I like to look at it as a slide, you know, I'm holding my hands up like a spectrum and Mm -hmm. grief is on there. Really, we slide from one part to the next. And, and I like seeing it that way, because it doesn't lock us in. And it doesn't make us feel like we're bad at something, you know, if we haven't hit that acceptance stage, because to be honest, you know, it's not as if people haven't necessarily accepted that somebody has died. It's just that we have to accept our lives as fundamentally and irreversibly changed. Right. And that's the thing that we have the hardest time accepting. And so, yeah. So if somebody is listening, yeah, the five stages of grief were not really meant for us, the survivors. That's so good to know. Um, I, I know we're on short time and, and I so appreciate the hour with you. In your book, you had a quote from... Um, a 17th century Japanese poet, barns burnt down. Now I can see the moon that really struck a chord with me because um, sometimes in life, when everything is, is pulled away, torn away, it does give you a sense of clarity to see many things that we normally like wouldn't see or refuse to see. Just talk. Yeah. What, what prompted you to put the quote in the book? It just got <laughs> to me. Oh my goodness. Yeah. Well, that beginning of my loss, and it's in the very beginning of the book uh, where I talk about my loss, all in the matter of one week, I lost my mother to cancer. And as we were burying her, I had gotten a call from my job where I was a clinical director. And they said, you know, we are selling our building and you've got to come and get your things. And Mm. kind of my job was over. And I was like, well, I'm burying my mother right now. It's not a great time. Um, I go back to my New York City apartment and there was a notice under the door that uh, the building had been sold. And so I basically would have to move. And so I go to my favorite restaurant for refuge only to find out from the general manager that there was a landlord dispute. And now that was the last night of the restaurant. And the restaurant had been in New York city for 30 years. And all of a sudden now it was gone. And I laughed and I was like, this is really interesting. God, like (laughs) everything at one time that was comforting and foundational for me, uh, was wiped out. Mm -hmm. And I was packing up my apartment and I, I had a magnet on my refrigerator and this is, this was the magnet. And interestingly, I had, I, I obviously go in my refrigerator often and clearly just either didn't look at the magnet or just, you know, it was there, but it had a different meaning this time. And it, and it said, your barn, your barns burnt down, but now you can see the moon or my barns burnt down. And now I can see the moon. And it really stopped me in my tracks. And I thought, yeah, this is really it. My entire barn is gone and Mm -hmm. I've got nothing but what is above me and what's next. And yet there is a beauty in that unknown that feels strange to even acknowledge but there is uh, the beauty of a new beginning underneath the layers of fear and uncertainty and feeling like I'm on a different planet um, and what's next. But it, it brought comfort to me for at least a little while. Yeah, um, it, it struck, really struck a chord. It was just a great way to end this conversation. Is there anything else that you want to add um, to our listeners that, you know, might be beneficial to them when dealing with grief? Yeah, I mean, I think right now it is to just go as gently as you can to know that you are in a new place that will be really unpredictable sometimes, but to go slowly, if you can ask for what you need, please do, but accept that help. Um, You know, one of the best pieces that I of advice I could give is during times that feel like they're going to be hard, like the holidays or anniversaries Mm -hmm. is to prepare, 
And, you know, we can't always prepare what our triggers are, but we can prepare to see family that triggers us. We can prepare for holidays when we don't feel like we'll have what it takes to give and do what we used to do. Um, We can prepare for weddings that we might just not want to go to. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, the anticipation brings up so much anxiety, especially the first year after a loss. And so really, if you can and when you can prepare for those moments and get the support that you need. And if you're in therapy, ask your therapist to help you prepare for those moments. Brilliant idea. Gina, thank you so very much. Um, Thank uh, you for having me. It's such an honor to speak with you. I I hope we can do this again sometime soon. Let's do it. Yeah, definitely. Yes, I I, I, I wanna be on the sassy (laughs) downhouse. We'd love to have you again, trust me. There's so much. There's so much information that that can be beneficial to people, and you have such an eloquent and beautiful way of explaining it. And I, I can't tell you how appreciative I am. Thank you so much, Gina. Thank you so much for having me, and thank you for making it so comfortable that I could ramble quite Good. a lot. And this That's one, what it's so all thank about. you. <laughs> I appreciate you, and thank you for all you're doing. Your listeners are incredibly lucky to have you advocating and caring for them to give them so much great information. Thank you so much. It's so important, and we will be in touch again. We sure will. I don't doubt it. You better stay in touch, or I'm going to stalk you. <laughs> <laughs> I hope so.